We've already explored the voyage in our relationship to Yahweh. We've explored our voyage in our relationship to your calling. Now we're exploring the voyage in our relationship to others. And uh, we have been in this uh, voyage. We've been going back to what I call the garden. You know, so we're calling it the garden way, the way when Adonai started everything. If you're wondering why things are in a mess or why things are chaos or out of order, things are out of order when you don't understand how they began. The reason why you know, he who started from the beginning had a specific plan to produce order in your life, to produce order in our families, to produce order in our relationships. When we kind of ignore or maybe we might not be clear about exactly what his intentions were or what he, or what he meant when he made Adam and Eve, Adam and Chava in the garden, then that's when things get off course and we're either in the wrong ships, the wrong relationships, or we're taking the wrong voyages. But what we are doing is we're correcting the navigation. Amen? Amen. 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 So as we start in the garden, um, we are looking at Genesis chapter 2 right here. It says, Yahweh God took the man, put him in the garden. And Yahweh said, I will make him a helper comparable to him. So we broke this down last week. Et aselo ezer connecto. Now this is the word that's kind of like, like people get the help thing, but that connect no part, that, that helper corresponding to him, or that is compatible to him, or that is comparable to him. Now what's interesting, in, in uh, modern, if you say something, you're, if you're the odds, something, you're for something, if you're negative something, you're actually against something, which is kind of interesting. But now the opposite. Why did God allow things to be opposite in the male, female gender? Amen. Okay. Wow. More God. <laughs> Seriously? Like you, men, you know, you, you, ain't, you ain't have with your, with your wife. I mean, what's going on? Women, you have it. Look, there's a reason why God made him a specific way. It's supposed to be the reason why the world is perverted is because we don't respect it the way we should. We're not as grateful and thankful as we should. Right? Okay. So the whole point is these distinctives were, were, were these opposites, if you will, were that was a perfect design by God for the purpose of them joining together. Amen? Amen. The right way. However, I want us to look at that word sometimes when you use the word comparison or when you say uh, compatibility or even what is, what is opposite. And it breeds this, what I call this unnecessary competition. And the reason why there's this, quote unquote, you've heard it, the battle of the sexes. Well, that was never God's plan. God's plan was never for the sexes to be battling. They were supposed to be working together, right? All right, talk to me. Right, because you know I get you. So the whole point is, the, so when you start employing terms like that the world says that God never said, well, you know, love is a game. It is? Uh, I don't think it's a game. When you see what's happened to people's hearts, it's not a game. The battle of the sex, that was a little, if you're prophesying conflict and, and turmoil into your relationships, that's not what you're supposed to be receiving. God had a specific reason for this parts to work together, for these people to work together. And so what happens is it's become a competition. Now, the scriptures talk about those measuring and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Now, watch how this works. So, all of a sudden, we want a relationship because someone else has one. We want to be married because someone else is married. We're comparing themselves, but we're not thinking about the specific issue, why God created the man and the woman in the first place. So, as we broke it down last week, it's specifically for the kingdom of God. However, what happens is, People aren't perfected in God's definition of love. So we break down 1 Corinthians 13 the way I haven't heard it broke down. Because usually when people talk about, well, you know, love, it's unconditional. The scriptures do not say love is unconditional because the reality is, and so we keep it real in the congregation, right? Okay, so let's say you're married, okay, and your spouse has 17 other sexual accomplices. Is love unconditional? You have now a choice. God so loved the world that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That means there's a condition. If you don't believe him, in him, you don't have everlasting life. Mm -hmm. So the reality is, let's get back to God's definition of love. Because what's happened is they skip verse 6, which says, Love does not rejoice in iniquity. It doesn't rejoice in sin. So when people talk about, oh, it's, it's love, love is love. Well, it, yeah, you've got the Eros Greek definition of perverted love. But not God's definition of love, which is pure, righteous, holy, the God they love. And you will know the difference between the world's standard of love, which is corruptible, which brings destruction, and God's standard of love, when it brings the truth in righteousness. Now, but what it says is love does not envy. 
So when we're talking about the battle of the sexes and all this competition, that God said wasn't supposed to be there in the first place, and all of a sudden there's, there's jealousy and stuff going on, that was never God's plan. Anybody that's been in a relationship and all of a sudden envy and jealousy comes in and stuff like that, you need to call that out. You need to get that out of your garden. If you're looking or comparing yourself about somebody else, well, we need to be more like them, and it's in a way that because they got money or they got this, whatever, but it has no godly characteristics, that's envy. That's not God's love. I'm not jealous of anyone going to hell, first of all. I don't care how much, many millions of dollars they have. So you get 67 years and then you're lost forever. There's nothing to be jealous about that. Right? There's nothing to be comparing yourself to. If you have the love of God and you understand God's plan for your life and you have the blessed definition, expect God to do miraculous things on this side of eternity and the next side of eternity. Now, note 1D. The reason why it's the garden, the necessity of why we're going back to how God created the man and the woman. The perfecting love of the garden removes the distraction of jealous competition by focusing on what's best for you. Many times people are focused on, well, they're looking at these people or those people, whatever, but that's not what's best for you. That's what's best for them. That's why when God made Adam and Eve, guess what? No one else is there on purpose. Because they're not supposed to be wishing they had something better, wishing they had something different or complaining about that. That's not the plan. The garden weeds out this unnecessary jealous competition. Boy, it's quiet here. <laughs> you listen, you listen, man. <laughs> Hallelujah. So let's, let's get it. You ready? Let's go in some place. So now remember, but, but so we, we were careful not just to jump to, you know, God made the heavens and the earth. And then all of a sudden he made the stars. He made stuff, And then all of a sudden he just made a man and made a woman. But hold on, something happened before the right woman came on the scene. Okay? And here's what happens. Yahweh God brought every beast of the field and every bird of the air to see what he would call them. Hmm. Well, I mean, God didn't have names for them already? God didn't have names for them? He brought them to the man to see what the man was going to... How, what was, the God, was the man going to actually identify these things correctly? Because remember, they were in, in, he was searching for something. However, but for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Now remember what happened? God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. But before he actually got to finding the right one, there was these animals brought to him in the first place. These things that he wasn't compatible with. Brother, I'm sorry, everyone, you, you, you met the woman of your life, you met the man of your life, and that was it. You didn't have any animals before that experience? <laughs> man, it's quiet here. <laughs> Here's the point. Relationships are not supposed to be a zoo. The process of elimination identifies the right partner by calling out the wrong ones. He brought him to Adam to say, are you going to, listen, if they're flaky, you need to call them flaky. If they're lazy, you need to, if they're not saved, you need to call them not saved. If they're not righteous, you need to call them right, not righteous. I don't want to see if you're going to say what they actually are. Or are you going to compromise? Or are you going to, just because you really want a relationship, so you'll just take a dog, you'll take a sheep, you'll take whatever, as long as you got a relationship. Somebody say amen in this place. So we're going to get a little, a little intense tonight. Because remember, the reason why I started this series, because I was being honest about several people slash couples are not here in our congregation because of situations with relationships. And if all of us don't get on the same page with God's plan for relationships, we may, by the grace of God, find ourselves in the same, except for the grace of God, find ourselves in the same place. We need to take relationships seriously. Really see what God is telling us. Be honest. We've all made mistakes. We've all said things we should have done, done things we should have done. But the issue is not beating up people about our past or about our past mistakes, but it is about understanding the word teshuvah, repentance, so that we don't make those mistakes again. Right? So if we prevent it from happening in the first place, we won't always be in a position where we're always trying to cure it. Amen? That's the garden plan. Now, 
Note 3a, Dina, the daughter of Leah, went out to see the daughters of, this supposed to be the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Chavit, saw her, he took her and lay with her. Okay? Now, Vayikak Ota, Vayishkab Ota. He took her and he laid with her. I want to break this down specifically. Then it says, note 3b, his soul was strongly, say it with me, attached, attached to Dina, the daughter of Yaakov, and he loved the woman. But this word here, va bak nasho, va bak okay? This is the word I want you to pay attention to. He lay with her, then he's strongly attached. That word debak is exactly what God said in the garden when he said, for this reason a man should leave his mother and father and cleave. You read the word cleave in English. It's the same word, attach, debak, to his wife and they shall be one flesh. Specifically, cleave to his wife, okay, man and woman, they. Who's the they? The man and the woman. They shall be one flesh, basar chad. Now remember, this verse is important for two reasons, specifically theologically. It's extremely important to understand this theologically. They hayu They will be one flesh. They will be two fleshes. What? Okay, achad. This is not. There's an absolute unity, and then there's a compound unity. Okay, an absolute unity meaning there's just this is one finger, but this is one hand, but it's comprised of five fingers. So this is important. One flesh does not mean one person. One God does not mean one person. Remember? We've broken this down. This is an important thing to understand. The composite unity that the God put between the man and the wife also referring to him. So, when it says, Shema Yisrael Yahweh Eloheinu Yahweh Echad, it doesn't say Yahweh Yachid, doesn't mean that he is the singular, singular, absolute unity. He is the composite unity. We see this all throughout scripture with this word of God. Now, the reason why God remember, made the man and the woman, it represents his son and his bride. Now, sexual union, unions are for husbands and wives. Go ahead, fill in the blank. This is, this is, this is pretty cool. Only. Okay. He said, go back to 3C, just so that we're not confused or I'm not going too fast. A man leaves his mother and father, cleaves to his wife. They shall be one flesh. So the being attached to somebody, being attached to something, was a specifically initiated, originated in the garden because God wanted marriage to be consistent, everlasting, all that love stuff, but they wanted them to be one. Amen? That's the plan. Now, this is what I call an illegal soul tie, what you just read with Dina. And he attached, he slept with someone that was not his wife, and his soul was attached. The same word, the bach, that was used in Genesis 34, the same the word that is used in Genesis 2. This creating of soul tie is the reason why there's a lot of stuff that's going on in people's hearts and minds right now. Yeah, one person said amen, but I know there's been issues. Soul tie, now we don't talk about this. this stuff. Meanwhile, it's destroying people's families, hearts, lives, communications, relationships, but it's not ticking on one-on-one. -on -one. So when you take God's principle of basad, achad, when you take God's principle of the purpose of sexuality and you pervert it or restore it, then you have the mess that we call our world right now. But I want to get a little bit more... Uh, extreme, if you will. So, remember, his soul was strongly attached to Dina. He loved the woman, and then in certain English translations it says, and he spoke kindly to the young woman. But I want to be clear on what he really, what, what the, the, the Hebrew actually says. It says, He didn't just speak kindly, he didn't just say, you look good tonight. What's going on? Yeah, yeah. That, that, no, no. <laughs> Specifically, his soul was strongly attached and he spoke to her heart. The lay. So he wasn't just giving compliments, but specifically, 
there was this soul tie, but now it wasn't just because it was just a physical thing. There's something about talking to the heart of a young woman. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, here's the point. Soul ties are not just physical. Emotional soul ties can be created through verbal penetration of the flesh. So the dudes that I be talking to and disciple, I'm saying, here's the deal. You don't need to be whispering sweet nothing to somebody that is not your wife. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can sleep with her. I don't care. You don't, that she don't bother you? Oh, you think a soul tie is just physical? These people running off with those people they met on the internet, they never actually even saw them? How did they do it? They just opened their mouth. <laughs> that is what I call speaking to the flesh. And I keep it, I, I'm, I'm just saying, I know on some of this stuff I'm extreme on purpose, but that's, that, that's one of the ways you make it to be a 43 year old virgin. So I don't let people do that to me, and I don't do that to them. I don't manipulate my position, I don't try, if you're not my wife, I'm not, there's things I'm just not going to tell you. Yeah, I don't need to spot prophesy to your flesh. That's your, that's your father or your husband's responsibility. No other man should be doing that, and that goes both ways, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing, ladies, don't be talking to somebody. All right, moving right along. <laughs> now, here, why, hold on, why should you, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman and be embraced in the arms of a seductress? Now, listen to this. When we're talking about seduction, remember, Things happen with seducing before it's even physical. That's, what, that's why people have missed this, this whole thing, and, and they're just automatically thinking that, well, because I haven't you know, had physical relations, therefore it's not known. You're creating a bond that, that is ultimately a seduction. It's a verbal seduction that, that happens and it manipulates people. Mm -hmm. Now it says, this is Proverbs. That's why Michelet, listen, this book, I'm telling you, a lot of times people, when they think about wisdom, they're like, well, what's wisdom for? What's, you know, I want wisdom to know what to do. On wisdom. And what I really understand about wisdom, what it's also good for, usually most of the wisdom I've got is telling me what not to do, what to just stay away from. Before I even get involved in someone, most of the wisdom in my life has been specifically just don't do it. But I don't know what to do. Don't worry about what you should do. Just make sure you're clear on what you should not do. The lips of a forbidden, or the, the Hebrew word zara, strange or alien woman, drip honey. Come on. That's seduction. Now I got the lips of a, because we're not sexist here, the lips of a man or a woman. It goes both ways. But in the end, and this is what people don't think about a soul tie. See, at, at the beginning, it's, it does what it's supposed to do, it peels your flesh, it, but at the end, someone's getting jacked. At the end. And if you have just gotten by and never, nothing's, nothing's ever happened or whatever, and then you're just automatically selfish and not considering their soul and the torment they may be going through. In the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two edged sword. Hold on, but hey, hey, isn't that enough? No. Her feet go down to death, her steps lay hold of hell. And that's what I'm watching. Relationships in hell. Tormented for completely abandoning wisdom. There we go. Now, what I like about this verse in Revelation, like when we think about the people that are in hell, okay? And you got automatically, you got, oh, the obviously the murderers. And, you know, the, the child molester, that, that's what people automatically go to, right? And soon as when people talk about, well, I'm a good person because I didn't kill anybody, that's what they all, that's their go-to. The murderer's the one. You could have robbed every blind and poor person on the planet, but at least you didn't murder anybody. But God looks at sin and just says sin. We're all, listen, sin is sin is going to take you there. Either you've been forgiven of it, you've been cleansed of it, or you have. Either you're repented of it, or you have. It's not for me to compare my sin with your sin and you to compare my sin. That's not what God says because we don't compare ourselves among ourselves, right? We're just honest about this is right, this is wrong. But in the list, the first thing that it talks about the people that are in the lake of fire says the cowardly, the unbelieving, 
the abominable, the murderers. Then it lists fornicators. Then it lists sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. Now remember, 5C is talking about specifically the, the destruction of an immoral woman or, or an immoral man. And it talks about her steps laid hold of hell and they're going down to death. And then it talks about in Revelation these things that also bring people to hell. But then it says this is the second death. Okay? Because that's the spiritual death. There's a physical death and there's a spiritual death. Most people are only concerned with the physical death. The physical death, a temporary death. You get 60 years maybe. And then after that, forever. Forever is the spiritual death. That's why we preach the gospel here. Here's the point. The name of tonight's sermon is, The Booty Ain't Worth It. <laughs> so here's the point. No booty is worth dying for physically or spiritually. Preach. Come on. Now, keep in mind how God takes this seriously, though. So some of us in here have had great marriages. Some of us in here have had challenges with marriages. But at the end of the day, the plan for marriages still is the same. God loves marriage. God loves the design of the man and woman. God wants to see it successful. But he's also clear about the warfare, the demonic assault against the man and the woman together in, in holy matrimony because of what it represents. Now, also in the garden, if you remember, Adam and Eve also forsook the commandments. They ate from the tree. But then God, in his mercy, because right then it could have been over, should have been over, but God does something. That does something. It says that uh, Yahweh God said the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And that was the, that's, the, that's the manipulation. See, we think, well, because there's some good in it. You know? Well, there's some good in them. I know it. Like they're Darth Vader or something. I know there's good in you. This dude just literally destroyed. Indoor, destroyed, whatever. But I know there's good in you. We're still going to keep up alive. This man has beat you over and over and over. But I know there's good in you. She's cheated on you several times, but I know there's good. You're not calling the Adam. You're not calling them what they are. The mixture of good and evil, that's the problem. The evil perverts and distorts what God wants for you. So the tree was not the tree of good. It was the tree of good and evil. The perverse, because that's the devil's lie. He'll put enough good in it to deceive you to overlook the evil. So, Yahweh God said, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil, lest he take also the tree of life. Now, this is important because people forget there were two trees in the garden. The Eitz Chaim, two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Notice that they're separate because life does not have evil. Life is only good. Life is only true. Life is only righteous. Why? Why was God interested in keeping this person from the tree of life after they took of the tree of good and evil? Because the tree of life means just that, just that, life. And if they eat, then they'll live forever. What does it mean? Live forever in a tormented, fallen, destructive state. The first plan of the enemy, the first plan of Hasatan, was to get them to disobey God and then have physical consequences. The second plan was for them to then live eternally in a fallen, destroyed state forever spiritually. So God seeing the enemy already setting Adam up, setting Adam and Eve for that next final state, what's he do? Yahweh God sent him out of the garden. So you made some mistakes, you crossed lines, you should have crossed, and then all of a sudden, there is still that last stage of mercy where God says, you still can get out of this. You think this was so bad it can't get worse. Uh, yes, it can. 
The two things that they that, that when people have gone to heaven and back. Now listen, I don't take every story. I'm not always reading every like, oh, you went to heaven? Tell me what happened. Like, that's not what I do. But things that resonate with my spirit. They say the best thing about being in heaven with Yeshua is that it gets good, and then it gets good, and it gets better, and it gets better, and it continually becomes the best thing ever over and over and over. It just never stops getting better. But they say the worst thing about hell is that it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And let me tell you something. I've been in a few relationships where I believe that it's true. I've seen that happen. Oh, it can't get any worse than this. I'm like, it just did. <laughs> <laughs> So here's the mercy. And this is what I call the flaming sword principle. So when I'm not, quote unquote, smart enough or wise enough or, or spiritual enough, God will send flaming swords that will keep me from destroying myself. So what it says is he drove, note 6 eight, he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword was turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. Make sure that you do not do that thing that's going to finish you off. Okay, you made a mistake. Okay, you said God is still saying, test your God. There's still repentance. You still can come back from this. So the flaming sword guards. Guards the light, right? The same thing. The reason why we're talking about soul ties and how it relates with the garden is the most precious garden lives inside of your body, and that's called your heart. And the scriptures say that you are to guard your heart with all diligence. Guard your heart. The same way, like that flaming sword, I don't care who you are, if you are not right, if you're not born again, if you do not have the spirit of life in Christ, if you're not, that will not be attached to my soul. That will not be penetrating my heart. And you will know them by their fruits. Not by what they, not by what they say, but what they do. I say it all the time and because I live. I don't tell you what, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it. I just show up, here you go. I don't listen to what people say. I watch what they do. You don't need to brag about how spiritual you are. You don't need to tell me about it. It doesn't matter. What are you doing? You'll know them. By the fruits. Amen? Amen? So guard. Guard your heart. Comparing that to a garden. Right? Marriage. Your heart, soul ties, and a garden. All work together. In the Song of Solomon, and trust me, like, this is as far as I'm going in this book. We say this one verse, I'm moving. Like, we're not going to be talking about towers or sheep or anything like that, okay? I'm just going to say this real quick and then move on. I, from this little half of you, I can just tell I've not read the Song of Solomon. What's the problem? Okay. Anyway, he says, you figure this out. I have come into my garden. And then he says, my spouse. Guard your heart. With all diligence, out of it are the issues of life. How does this compare to the garden? Here's the whole point. The same way you're supposed to guard your heart, the same way God guarded the garden, physically, emotionally, or verbally, penetrating a heart that does not belong to you is trespassing in someone else's garden. Guard that thing. And what I say is, people don't think that don't think that I'm just saying I walk in paranoia. I'm just guard my heart, whatever. I, when I'm talking to dudes, I'm like, you better guard her heart. If you don't, if you're not in love with her, if you don't really like, you're not gonna marry her. Leave her alone. Protect that garden. Why? Because that's what I want somebody to do to my wife. I want somebody to protect her. The scriptures say, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Well, if you don't like you mess with. You don't like to be manipulated. You don't like to be lied to. Why would you mess with, manipulate, or lie to someone else? So the hypocrisy, that's the first thing, needs to stop in the kingdom of God. 
first people that come and complain about, oh, she did this, she did this, whatever, blah, blah. And I'm like, dude, you just, remember what you did then? Reaping what you sowed just a little bit? Guard the guard. Amen? So, well, you're saying soul ties and, you know, spirituality. You're talking about just speaking to people. And I said, look, Jesus even breaks this down in Matthew 5. Whoever looks at a woman with intentions to lust after her has committed adultery with her in his heart. Guard your heart with all diligence. The heart represents a garden. Within the heart, that is where there is the adultery, the murder, the blasphemy, the thefts, and the fornication. What are you talking about, Jason? You're just, just saying stuff? No. Jesus says, Matthew 15, out of the heart proceeds evil thought, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, witnesses, and blas false witnesses, and blasphemy. What's issuing out of that garden of yours? Pruning the garden, protecting the garden. This is the problem. At the end of the day, we, we're, we're, we have the campaigns about abstinence, and we've got like, you know, make sure you don't sleep with someone that's not your wife or whatever. But the problem is, it's too late by that point. We need to get ahead of the game and understand where people, where it starts. The soul stop tie doesn't start with the physical act. The soul tie starts in the garden of your heart. And so we prepared men to be pimps and players, and we prepared women to prostitute their bodies and look a certain way so that they can get a man. We're literally in a dysfunctional garden. And the kingdom of God needs to represent and start sparing the hearts of the next generation. I do not want my daughter to be destroyed. I'm talking about what? You got daughters? I'm talking about my goddaughters. The reason why I treat them the way I treat them is because I understand that their father is supposed to treat them a, a specific way. But the reason why I treat them the way I treat them is because I want them to know this is how a man, it doesn't matter if he's not your father, this is how a man is supposed to treat you. So here's the point about our hearts. So we think, of, oh, my heart, we don't want to just break their hearts. Here's the issue, honestly. Our hearts are not just broken emotionally, they're just broken fundamentally. That's the whole issue. That's all. That, like, we can't just point the finger, point the finger at you and point the finger at you. This is the problem of man. And it doesn't matter how spiritual that they act or how many degrees that they have or how many scripture verses they have. But at the end of the day, if they haven't dealt with their heart, the inside, always trying to make the outside look good and always trying to impress people, that doesn't matter. What about your heart? Deal with your heart. So that's why the scriptures say you need to be circumcised in your heart. That's why the truth of Yeshua is that he didn't just come to circumcise the outside, but he came to circumcise the heart. Adonai says Yahweh will circumcise your heart. Jeremiah says God will circumcise your heart. Ezekiel says that he will give you a new heart. Because we can deal with the outside, but if we have not taken care of the inside, eventually the outside will crumble. So there's a fundamental issue in the heart. And so in the sins of that are listed, you've got, it's not just, oh, the reason why that there's a sexual deviance or whatever. Listen, there was, it was next to thefts. It was next to blasphemies. It was next to lying. It was next to cowardice. Because these are the fundamental issues of heart that lead to these soul ties. So in conclusion, we can talk about the problem, but our congregation, is here to focus on the solution. So the reason why we preach the anointing here, the reason why we preach about the Messiah here, because what we're trying to do is say, if you want the right answers, you've got to ask the right questions. If you want to identify the right solution, identify the right problem. And the problem is the heart. So here in Luke chapter 14, it says, uh, as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on Sabbath day, stood up to read, and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. Now, I just want you to understand that I, sometimes I like to use this at Seder's just because I, I understand <laughs> the, the passage of scripture is powerful to me because one of the cups is a, a, a cup of acceptance and stuff like that. So sometimes I can use this verse. I understand that Isaiah is not in the five books of Moses, but I, it's just interesting to me. He's on the Sabbath, and they have, you know, a Torah rotation. They have a specific passage, and 
They can debate about when that actually started, when it did. But, is that, but at the end of the day, in the synagogue, he's handed Isaiah, not one of the five books. Okay? This is very, very fascinating. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written. So, he doesn't just start with Isaiah chapter 1. And he's talking about, you know, come, let us reason together, though your sins are scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. He doesn't go to Isaiah 40, comfort ye all my people, right? He goes to Isaiah 61. And we're going to end where he ended. Now, the prophecy of the Messiah that is given in Isaiah 53 continues throughout the rest of the book. But there's something about the Messiah and what he's going to do in Isaiah 61. Now remember, what does Messiah mean, class? What? Right. That's why we keep re reiterating that. Oh, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the Messiah. Okay, well, if you're going to believe in Jesus Christ, you need to know what he means. Right? Messiah means anointed one. Mashiach. The reason why there's this word Christ, so when you go to John chapter 4, and it says, we have found the Messiah, which is interpreted Christ. Because Christ is an interpretation of the original Messiah. In John chapter 1 and John chapter 4 says the same thing. We found the Messiah, which is interpreted. When the Messiah has come, he will tell us all things. But Christ, the Gentiles, the Goyim, they didn't have the concept of an anointed one because they weren't looking for an anointed one. This was a Hebrew thing. So that's why they had to come up with Christ. But the original was... Messiah. So he's anointed. But more importantly, with what? Because remember, the high priest was anointed with this oil. And the oil represented what, ultimately? The Holy Spirit. So again, for someone who's like, well, I, I can't remember what Jason said when he was talking about the Messiah. What does it mean? All you have to do is go to Isaiah 61 or Luke chapter 4, verse 18. The spirit of Yahweh is upon me because he has anointed me. The Mashiach, the Messiah, is the one who's not just anointed, but he's anointed with the Holy Spirit. So this is why we know Yeshua was Messiah, because he wasn't just talking about it, he was being about it. And he was flowing in the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit. The miracle of resurrection, that was at the end. But before that, he's casting out devils, healing sick, open blind eyes. Why? Because he had the confirmation that he had the spirit of Yahweh God upon him. But watch. The spirit of God is here to save us from our sins and the rise of... Hold on. Look what it says. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And he sent me to heal the broken hearted. And so what happens is when you think of broken heart, you're automatically going into relationships, right? Oh, this person's done me wrong. But listen, broken heart is ultimately the fact that there's a default mechanism within it, period. You don't have to be in a relationship to have a broken heart. Blasphemies, lying, rebellion, stealing, lying, that has nothing to do with relationships, but that is out of a broken heart. Now, it includes, I, I understand that. He, he, he understands the, the, the pain of, of losing a, a, a precious relationship. It includes that, but I want us to understand everything that he's talked about in the Messiah and the anointing is to heal every burden of the broken heart, every mechanism that has broken the heart in the first place. And then what he says is to proclaim Liberty, the roar to the captives. Broken heart, wait a minute. I thought broken heart and to restore your relationship. The broken heart and to find you the love of your life. No, because there's something about when a broken heart brings you into captivity. So the second name of tonight's sermon is heart and soul ties. Heart and soul ties. So we're dealing with this relationship issue. Some of you are in here and saying, but I, I did the right thing. I was waiting, I, was, I, I believe God, I was waiting, and all of a sudden, listen, 
God understands that disappointment too. And the same anointing that can fix the perversion of a heart can also still heal. Literally, lachvosh, to bind up your wounds, to bind up that broken heart. Yeshua's spirit delivers us from the brokenness that our hearts and souls are tied to. Because a soul tie is not just physical, it's also emotional, verbal, and spiritual. Amen? Amen. Amen. Stand up on your feet with me, please.